Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, author, uh, I'm going to get this right. Jaina Gersovich will give a presentation based on her book, Vacation Guide to the Solar System, Science for the Savvy Space Traveler. So Jaina, uh, who who's a, has a PhD, uh, has served as the Outreach Coordinator for Columbia University's Astronomy Department. She's been an adjunct professor at the City College of New York, Cooper Union School of Art, and the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, she was the Catherine W. Davis Postdoctoral Fellow at the American Museum of National History, where she taught future high school science teachers with the Master of Art in Teaching program, and where she hosted shows for the Astronomy Live series at the Hayden Planetarium. Uh, Jaina received her undergraduate degrees in astronomy, physics, and mathematics, oh my gosh, uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she received her doctorate in astronomy at Columbia University. Her research interests include dwarf galaxies and interstellar gas, and she discovered two previously unknown local galaxies. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. <laughs> so we again thank the Friends of the Library for sponsoring, and uh, all uh, 50 plus of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jaina for joining us this afternoon. And Jaina, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to talk to you today about um, what science reveals about the human experience of visiting other worlds. And this is kind of a fun topic for me. So um, as Robert mentioned, um, my uh, scientific work focused mainly on galaxies and in particular, um, small galaxies, dwarf galaxies. Um, and these are really fun, interesting objects that are very dark matter dominating, dominated and are fascinating in their own right. Um, but as I was finishing my thesis, so working hard, um, writing all day long, I got this kind of unusual call one day. Um, and it was um, my future co-author, Olivia Kosky, from an organization called Gorilla Science. And she said, would you like to come to an arts festival and plan people's space vacations? We need an astronomer to help us with some of the scientific content um, and, and plan these space vacations realistically. And I said, this sounds much better than being chained to my office chair <laughs> all day long. And so um, I started collaborating with, with Olivia and with Gorilla Science on this project. And it was so much fun. We, we started, this is um, us, Olivia's on the left, I'm on the right, and another um, astronomer, I think she's at the Adler Planetarium now in Chicago. This is Lucianne Wachowicz in yellow. And we set up um, it, a, a travel agency, a space travel agency um, in Midtown Manhattan. Um, so you can imagine the, the clientele that are walking by. Um, and so, uh, so we, we got a little grant we set up shop. Um, we had people come in and we'd ask them, you know, what do you enjoy doing on vacation? And then we would adapt that to different uh, destinations within our solar system using real science as the basis for that. So this was tons of fun. We got to dress up and, and decorate these, um, the, our travel agency and develop all of these opportunities. And always, we would ask people, you know, how much time do you have to take this vacation? You know, how much money do you have? This is Manhattan, so some people <laughs> had a lot, but nobody offered us billions and millions of dollars. Um, and these are very rough estimates based on prices for different um, probes that have been sent out um, and the time that it took took those probes to get to these locations. So. People were um, inevitably unable to actually take these vacations. Um, so as a consolation prize, we would offer them a green screen photo um, at one of their destinations and let them um, write a postcard um, as if they were from space. And so that's just kind of the basis of where this all started. We, we started doing these events and I planned thousands of space vacations and we had so much fun doing it. Uh, Olivia and I decided to write a book called Vacation Guide to the Solar System. And this was super fun for me to research because it meant I got to call up all of my planetary science friends and ask them crazy questions. Like if you could travel you know, to the moon, what would you do there? <laughs> um, and so, so the conceit of this um, is that there is regular travel to different planets in the solar system, which obviously we know 
this is not the case. We haven't visited a, a, another planet. We've only put you know people on the moon so far. Um, but uh, but we're imagining a scenario in which those uh, technological challenges have been overcome. And what would the experience be like? What would you smell when you go to the moon? Um, what would be some of the activities you might want to do in these different places? What are the sites that you could see and the experiences that you could have? And what would it really be like to, to visit there? And so that's what we were really trying to capture in a scientifically accurate way in the book. Um, and so here we go. We're going to start on our vacation and visit a bunch of different places. Um, and, you know, the nice thing is, is that space isn't very far away. It might be hard to get to, but again, in our conceit, we are just going to be able to travel there easily. Um, but, you know, it's only 250 some miles up, um, which is just, you know, the distance between New York City and, and Washington, D.C. So not so far away, a little bit difficult to get to. Um, and so here, that's about the, the altitude of the International Space Station, which is pictured here. Um, and so what are you going to experience? You know, you're going to have to deal with um, some odd, uh, odd things like having to strap yourself in, um, in, in order to, to not float around and bump your head while you're sleeping. Um, and you're going to have to deal with um, uh, your body working differently and your legs becoming skinny because of the redistribution of, of water in your body and all of these different physical effects. Your eyesight might change because your eyeballs are changing shape because they're so used to existing in a gravity environment. Um, so it's really, you know, we're starting out with our body and we're gonna go and travel starting nearby. So the first place we're gonna travel to is the moon, not a planet, but of course a, an, a very interesting solar system body. And our closest one, you know, it's only it only takes maybe three days to get there. Um, I think that's what they're estimating somewhere between 2.5 and, and four days to get there for the um, Artemis um, uh, astronauts when they eventually are sent there. Um, and it's kind of a unique thing because I'm imagining if there's a hotel on the moon that um, there's this kind of unique thing where the same side of the moon is always facing the earth. It's what we call tidally locked. So um, the, the earth over time has exhibited a torque on the moon such that we only see one side of it. Um, the side that you know, contains the man in the moon or um, you know, in Chinese culture, they see a, a rabbit in the moon. Um, and so we're always seeing the same side no matter when we're seeing the moon. The moon moves through our sky but we always are seeing roughly the same side of it. And that's because it spins once on its own axis in the same time it takes to go once around. And again, not a coincidence. It just has to do with how tides pull and torque the moon. Um, but it also leads to some interesting observations that you can have of the earth from the moon. So depending on where you land on the moon, the earth will be in the same location in the sky. It's not gonna move through the sky um, like the moon moves through the Earth's sky as we're observing it. Um, and so I'm imagining they build a hotel on the moon and they put the windows so that the Earth is always in there. And you could actually see the Earth go through um, different, uh, different phases. So whether we have a crescent, you know, from Earth we see crescent moon or full moon or a new moon, we would see the Earth go through a similar um, cycle of, of, of looking differently in your window from your, from your moon hotel window. <laughs> um, or perhaps you just, you really, really need to get away. The nice thing is on half the surface of the moon, you couldn't see the Earth at all. And, you know, hopefully they haven't put up any satellites or cell towers and you can just get, you get no uh, cell coverage there whatsoever. So you could just complete blackout zone blocked off by um, the bulk of the moon. And I think I need some of that these days, completely cut off. <laughs> and of course you wanna see some of these um, beautiful craters. Um, so here's what you might be observing. Um, uh, and so uh, an interesting thing, what you're seeing on, on the surface is, is there's a really, really fine dust called regolith. 
And one interesting thing that the um, Apollo astronauts noticed when they went back into their vessel, um, they tracked a little bit of this regolith, this little bit of moon dust with them, and they said it smelled like gunpowder. And so it's not exactly clear, you know, what chemical constituents are causing that smell. But if you want to imagine what it smells like on the moon, um, of course, you want to be wearing a suit when you're outside, but when you come in, um, it smells apparently like gunpowder. This is a super interesting place you might want to visit um, on the moon. It's called Rainier Gamma. So most of the surface of the moon is really dark, um, surprisingly dark like asphalt. So most people don't think of it that way because you're seeing all that bright sunshine reflecting off of it. Um, but this is uh, kind of like a, a lunar swirl. Um, so various colors of dust have collected in different places. And it's not completely understood. It's a, it's a little bit of a mystery. They think it has to do with how the moon's magnetic field is kind of channeling incoming dust. Um, but it's not clear what makes these light and dark patterns. Um, just we can observe them and we see that they exist and they're quite beautiful. And, uh, and so um, I'm interspersing, of course, real images and um, illustrations from the book. So here's an example of, of what you might want to do on the moon. Um, the moon's gravity is only about one sixth the surface gravity of Earth. So you could um, uh, roughly jump six times as high and you could hit a baseball um, more than six times as far. Um, so you've got the, uh, the added um, aspect of less gravity, less surface gravity, um, but you also have no um, wind resistance because there's no atmosphere to speak of on, on the moon. And so you'd be able to hit some really incredible home runs. So I'm imagining if you're playing baseball on the moon, they'd have to make a very, very um, large uh, baseball diamond in order for something to work. You'd have to, you'd have to change the rules at least. All right, so let's go to Mercury. Here's a picture on the right is actually the moon and on the left is Mercury. And um, uh, Mercury is gonna be a rough place to stay alive. I would recommend staying on the side that is not facing the sun because you are so close to the sun. You don't have the protection of an atmosphere or much of a magnetic field. Um, and so you're gonna get uh, fried <laughs> if you're on the sunlit side. But one interesting thing you might want to, to um, dangerously check out is um, the line between the lit side of Mercury, so the side facing the sun and the dark side of Mercury. Um, so that line, that kind of transition between the light and dark is called the terminator. And, um, and it actually moves very slowly just because of how um, Mercury rotates. Um, it moves very slowly, um, just a few miles per hour. And so you could actually kind of walk behind that um, at a, a slow, nice leisurely pace. Um, so that might be um, a fun activity to do on Merc Mercury. All right, so moving on to slightly less uh, dangerous or irradiated <laughs> locations, um, which is, it's funny to say that because this is a picture of the surface of Venus not thought of as a very hospitable environment. And uh, so this picture was taken by um, a Soviet probe, Venera 14, managed to take this picture and then it, um, it succumbed to the extreme pressures and temperatures on Venus. This was the last thing it sent. Um, but you can kind of see the surface, it's a little bit distorted because of the angles, um, but you can see the, this kind of interesting uh, rocky surface. Um, the surface of Venus is, is really hot. It's hot enough to melt tin. Um, uh, there's a corrosive environment. There's a lot of pressure. So I imagine if we're visiting there, we're, we're going in um, with well protected. <laughs> um, here we have like a tank going on the surface of Venus. Um, and uh, the, the real interesting part um, of visiting Venus. I think the, the more hopeful <laughs> ideas for visiting Venus is actually to visit its, uh, its cloud layers. So up in the atmosphere, up in the clouds of Venus, um, it's surprisingly Earth-like. So Venus is about the same mass, about the same size as Earth. 
Um, and, uh, and up in the cloud layers, even the pressure is similar to Earth. The temperature is similar to Earth's. Um, you do get corrosive sulfuric acid um, kind of uh, clouds up there. So that's something that you'd have to deal with um, if you were visiting. Um, but it might be, you know, a very, um, a, a very Earth-like place to visit, um, even compared in some ways to the surface of Mars, um, just because you do have, you know, you have that pressure, you have that temperature. Um, and so you could imagine going in airships and as long as you were staying off of that surface, you'd have conditions that were more conducive to staying alive. All right, moving on to Mars. So here we have um, a picture of a sunset on Mars. And so you can kind of see, it looks a little bit different than sunsets on Earth. You have um, a red sky towards the edges. You can kind of see the, the ambient color of the sky. And then you can see um, how the atmosphere um, is, is uh, blue around the around the actual disk of the sun. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, when we see a sunset on Earth, what we're seeing is a lot of that light is um, the blue light is scattered away from our line of sight because there's so much atmosphere. So the atmosphere on Mars is much less dense, much sparser than our atmosphere here on Earth. And so it, it reacts with the different colors of light differently, refracts um, a little bit less. And so here it's getting scattered, but we're getting the blue light instead. Very beautiful, darker than we're, usual, than we're used to. Um, and, the, and the beautiful red rocks of Mars here. Um, and this is images from, um, I believe, Spirit, Spirit or Opportunity. I can't remember which one. Um, so Mars has these two uh, small moons, Phobos and Deimos. Um, and uh, you could actually jump over the height of the Earth's tallest building on it. So it has really low surface gravity. And so you could imagine this would be a great place to kind of hop around and do these crazy jumps. Um, and also on, um, on uh, Deimos, you could throw a baseball into orbit. That's how, how low the escape velocity is. Um, and so you could imagine that people visit this place, sign their names on a baseball, throw it into orbit, and you've got all of these baseballs going around um, the moon of one of the moons of Mars. Um, and my fit personal favorite um, kind of where I would go <laughs> if I went to Mars is um, Valles Marineris. So this is a huge canyon on Mars. And it goes about a fourth of the way around the planet. It's huge, um, it's deep, it's much deeper than the Grand Canyon, for example. Um, and I think it would be incredible to go inside and, and take a peek. So that's what you're seeing, this, this kind of scar that you're seeing across the surface of Mars here. Uh, that's all Valles Marineris there. And you can kind of see on the on one of the sides, there's a few like um, uh, little pimple-like things. Those are, um, there's three of them in a row. Those are some big volcanoes. Um, so that would be another um, key attraction on Mars would be these volcanoes. So this is an image of uh, Valles Marineris. This is a rendering from radar, Im for radar data of the depth of this canyon. So you can kind of get a sense of what it would be like to stand on the rim. And I think it would be really fun to go climbing um, in Valles Marineris. Um, and so um, one of the things is like, what, it would, what would it be like to go climbing in this low gravity environment? So Mars, Mars gravity is about a third of Earth's roughly. Um, and so would you still need to use ropes? Would you be fine if you fell? No, you wouldn't be. Um, you would actually, um, you would accelerate more slowly at the beginning, um, but then you'd get going fast enough to harm, <laughs> to really injure yourself. Um, also because of the, the lack of atmosphere. So another thing that affects how fast you're eventually gonna fall if you're falling a long distance 
is whether you get that air resistance. And so um, it would still be very dangerous, maybe even a little more dangerous to be climbing on Mars. And here's just another view of, um, of these mountains and hills from the rover's perspective. All right, so here we have a comparison. We have Mount Everest and um, a comparison to the largest volcano, which is just huge. It's um, uh, Olympus Mons. This is on Mars. It's the largest um, volcano in the solar system. And, uh, and it's dormant, uh, it's no longer active. Um, but it's it's really big <laughs> and it's kind of not very steep. So I think it would make a good hike. Uh, it would take a length, a long, long time for you, but it wouldn't be too steep for you to go up. Um, and at the middle of it you, is the part, the indentation, um, the caldera. Um, I think it'd be really fun to, um, to visit that. All right. So now we're heading out. And so again, the conceit of this whole thing is that we're traveling to places all the time. Um, but I just want to point out that the inner planets, the inner solar system would be much easier to reach than these outer planets. They're just, they're just much closer in and, um, and dense, more densely um, distributed as compared to these outer planets that I'm going to start talking about now. Um, so these are, we're going to start talking about the gas giant planets. Um, and so um, I hope someday we get to visit these because um, because of all the fun moons and because of all the fun features, but, but it's going to take a lot longer to get there. <laughs> um, so, you know, pack your video games. I love this video. This is a video of an approach to, um, to Jupiter um, and it's, it's real. It's taken by the Juno probe um, and it's a little bit choppy. That's not um, our connection. That's because it's a series of images, still images that were taken um, by this probe. But what I love about it is it shows a side of Jupiter that you're probably not used to seeing. Um, and, and that's the pole. So we're kind of coming up on one of the poles right now. And you can see how, um, you can see all the swirls. So there's a lot of like, um, uh, uh, what you're seeing is different cloud layers and different chemical compositions of clouds that are swirled together in these beautiful patterns. I mean, it just looks like I do, I do um, water marbling as like a craft. I love it. <laughs> and it just reminds me so much of these water marbling patterns. Um, but of course, what it is, is it's the winds and storms of Jupiter. Um, and we're starting to come around to the, the, the parts of Jupiter that you've maybe seen before, those stripes, although it's a little bit hard to tell because we're so close in right now. And you can see little dots um, kind of popping up here and there. You can see one right now in the upper left. Those are the tracks of, um, of moons as they're going past. Um, so, oh gosh, Jupiter has, I don't even know how many moons it has now. They keep adding, they keep finding new moons. So I'm out of count. Um, back when I wrote the, the book, I think it was, it was 70 some, but I think it's much higher now. I think it might be in the nineties, but don't quote me on that. Um, but the point is lots of moons um, and you've got these beautiful um, cloud patterns going on. Not just the big red spot, of course, that too. You really see it in detail. And you can see the, the bands and zones, those are um, the winds going in different directions. So if you're going to you know, go into the atmosphere of Jupiter, um, I think it would be, you know, you, if you start out at the top, there would be layers. So it looks like a solid ball. Of course, it's all made of gas. Um, <clears throat> but what I think you'd really experience is, you know how you're in a plane and you go through the cloud layer, it would be cloud layer after cloud layer. Um, and, and what we're seeing is different layers um, of those clouds being exposed and that's kind of creating the different colors that we're seeing. Just absolutely beautiful. I don't wanna move on because I wanna <laughs> see it till the end, okay. All right. Um, another thing uh, that Jupiter has going for it is these extreme magnetic fields um, so it has a much, much stronger magnetic field than Earth's magnetic field. And the magnetic field funneling particles from the solar wind in and those particles interacting with the atmosphere 
is what causes aurora or our northern lights. So Jupiter has northern and southern lights um, as well. And it has kind of an extreme version of these. Um, and if you were going to look at it with your eyes, you'd probably see it as a pink or a purple color, which is which what's depicted here. Um, but a lot of the energy is actually being um, emitted in colors that your eyes can't see um, because it is so energetic. Um, but I think it would be an amazing thing to view. Here's, um, this is actually false um, color. I think this is x-rays. Um, but, but here you can actually see the aurora as recorded from a telescope. Um, unfortunately, you're going to have to be careful <laughs> around Jupiter because that magnetic, magnetic field and the particles that it kind of traps, it creates a lot of radiation. So it would not be a healthy place to stay. So what I would recommend is um, that you travel to the moons. And um, the nice thing about the moons is a lot of them have oceans. The big ones, the four big ones have oceans. Um, uh, or, or actually, not Io, sorry. Three of them have oceans. So uh, from left to right here is Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And these are the four big Galilean moons of Jupiter. Um, and the nice thing about visiting Jupiter is you get all of these different environments, right? You can visit the gas giant. Um, but you can also um, visit a volcano world. So Io, which is the one on the left here, the one that looks like kind of an overdone pizza, that one is covered in volcanoes. Um, it doesn't have much of an atmosphere though. So it's kind of like ice and volcanoes, which is kind of an odd combination. Um, but those volcanoes are really pumping um, uh, eruptions high into the atmosphere. I'll show you an image of, of, of that in a little bit. Um, so it would be a, kind of a, a crazy experience to stand on the surface, just covered in sulfur and ice. Um, the next one over, the second one from the left is uh, Europa. And so this is one of the candidates for life. So I would love to drill through the ice. This is like an ice world. Underneath it, though, is a big ocean. Um, but it's like 20 kilometers of ice. So um, it's, it's a really thick ice shell. Although it does have all of these cracks, that's what you're seeing kind of in red here. Um, but we don't know what's under it. We've never sent anything in there, um, but I'm sure it's fascinating. <laughs> and Ganymede and Callisto also have subsurface oceans, um, more water than on Earth, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, but the nice thing is, uh, if you go into the water, you're protected from that radiation from Jupiter. So I'd recommend finding your way in there um, hanging out in there, it's a lot safer. <laughs> um, and here is, this is a real image from the Juno spacecraft um, of Io, the, the um, volcano world against Jupiter. I just love it. Just, you can really sense this scale here. And here again is Io. Um, and this is uh, one of the big eruptions of a volcano called Tvashtar on Io and you can see it's, this is huge, like the height of this eruption and the umbrella that is coming down um, off of it, it would just be incredible um, and probably very dangerous <laughs> to be standing next to. Um, again, Europa is the icy world. That was the thick ice. Um, here's another depiction of it. And, um, and so here's uh, an illustration from the book kind of an imagining of um, what could be going on underneath. Um, and what's pictured here is something we find in the deep earth ocean, which are these black smokers. We don't know if they exist, but we do know um, that life on like life can exist and on them here on earth, even though it seems like a very inhospitable environment and it's fueled by um, uh, not by light from the sun, but by the heat and chemicals from the inside. And so if there is life underneath Europa, it might take a form like this. All right, on to Saturn. This is the hexagon on Saturn's pole, a real image of it. Um, and this is just like, it's basically like a wave-like jet stream, which is folded in on itself to become this hexagon. So they've been able to kind of create different shapes in, in laboratory experiments. Um, showing showing how this happens, but yeah, it's just winds that have created a pattern of a hexagon in the clouds. 
Um, and so here's um, our book illustration of that beautiful site. Of course, you're gonna to wanna to visit the rings. This is backlit version of the rings. And, um, and what it would be like, I mean, these look like a smooth kind of thing, but what they really are are these are chunks of ice. Um, and they can be anywhere from pebble sized to house sized, which is, I guess, kind of would be considered a small moon. Um, and there are also moons that orbit, um, especially in the gaps of these rings. And so it would be really fun to kind of park yourself on one of these moons that's orbiting within the, the plane of the rings of, of Saturn and take a ride and become a moon yourself for a little while. There's no lower limit to the definition of moon. So, <laughs> and here is my favorite place. And I think we're, um, yeah, so this is my, uh, my favorite place to visit in the whole solar system. And it's a moon of Saturn called Titan. And Titan is amazing because it's large, you know, per its name, it is large for a moon, but it has a thick atmosphere as a moon, right? Very unusual. Um, and so it kind of has this hazy uh, yellow atmosphere, but it's also got lakes and rivers. And these are not water lakes and rivers. They're made of methane and ethane um, because it's very cold. This again, we're in the outer solar system. So we're talking, you know, 300 degrees below zero, but there, but it's liquid. Um, it, methane and ethane is, is able to be liquid. So this is a beach vacation, you know, not a standard beach vacation, but, um, but it, it, it would be amazing to kind of go here. Um, there's also dunes um, and the dunes are um, kind of the consistency of granola and are very dark in color and um, they stretch around the equator of Titan. Um, and because Titan has such a thick atmosphere, um, you could probably become airborne if you wore a wingsuit and you could probably fly under your own power. Um, and so I'm just imagining you go there, you're flying in your own wingsuit, you're going over these dark dunes, you're seeing these, um, these beaches and lakes made out of methane and ethane. And I think that would be an incredible vacation. Um, here's peering through the, um, the clouds of Titan. So this is a false color image. And here you can see the sun glinting off of those lakes in the infrared. So we're kind of like cheating by taking a different type of light. Um, but here you can actually see the shape of, of some of those um, lakes that, um, and seas that are present on the surface of Titan. All right, so I'm gonna go, we're running out of time here. I wanna make sure you guys get some time to ask questions, um, but we can go to Uranus and I recommend skydiving on Uranus. Um, it is similar to skydiving on Earth, but um, of course you have, you have to be bungeed in from, from your orbiting spacecraft here. Um, otherwise you're not gonna make it back. Um, we've got Neptune here. Neptune has storms um, similar to the other gas giants. So here's an image of the storm and you can't really see what's going on here, but it's got high altitude clouds. So it's got cloud layers and these swirling, windy, windy storms going. Here's a close up. Um, and of course, not a planet anymore, but one of my favorites, Pluto, which has this nice heart-shaped plane called Sputnik Planum. Um, here's a real image um, from the Horizon spacecraft. Um, nitrogen ices, um, just some incredible views there as well. And uh, and great low gravity hiking at only one tenth of Earth's gravity. All right, so all this seems very pie in the sky um, to some extent. Um, and yeah, we were like taking a lot of liberties here. Um, but this is, you know, this is from 1918, this image here. And, um, and it's, if you look at it, you know, it says, you know, to the moon, 83 days. Now it takes us three. Um, you know, they didn't understand what space travel really was. They were just basing, basing this only on the distances that they inferred and the speed, um, two miles a minute, <laughs> which they say is a terrific, um, great speed for them. Um, but you can see how things have changed in a hundred years. So a hundred years in the future, how is our vision of what it is to travel the space station or the solar system? How is that going to change? Um, I think we'll be surprised. All right. Thank you guys so much. I'm happy to so take Jane, questions. Yep. So Jane, a wonderful job as expected. 
So folks, if you have any comments or questions for Jaina, please get them into the chat or into the Q&A. We have plenty of time for questions. Uh, let's see what we have. No, we just have more folks uh, giving me their cities and towns. And we have <laughs> Francis really exciting and doing claps for you in the chat. So folks, if you have any comments or questions for Jaina about anything she said, or I read her extensive uh, background in, a, in, in astronomy, if you want to ask her any questions, uh, feel free. Now is the chance. And I suppose I should say where I'm, I'm from. I'm coming to you from Somerville. I just moved here oh, <laughs> from welcome. New York. Oh, so there you go. I'm excited right. to be in Massachusetts. <laughs> well, well, welcome to Massachusetts. Thank you. Okay. I like, <laughs> like, I like it here your, so far. I like your skulls in the background. You're going to blend right Thank in. You. You're, 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 <laughs> Um, all right, so Chris says, uh, this was a very cool presentation. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Uh, Francis asks, what percentage likelihood do you think that there is that life exists in our solar system? So, <laughs> other, other, than, other than human life on Earth here. And, yeah. and what, what do you think? Oh, man. It's so hard. To, to, to extrapolate based on one data point. Um, so I just wanna say this is like not based on anything but um, extreme speculation, <laughs> but I, I think probably somewhere there is. Um, and, uh, and I just, I think because we're just not that special. <laughs> that's, that's, it's, it's not, it's not a scientific argument, right? Um, but, but there's also like a lot of places that have even even for what we know is necessary for life um, here on Earth, based on our little definition of it that we have, um, there's a lot of places we haven't looked yet, um, and so um, so I would say we are we are at least sorely uninformed <laughs> about whether there is life um, here in the solar system, and I personally believe somewhere there is. So uh, Eva Jane says this was so fascinating. While I have no desire to do any kind of space travel, <laughs> it's certainly intriguing to do this virtually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, a lot of great tools for that um, now. Um, uh, so the one that I'm most familiar with is a, is a um, it's actually more like planetarium software, um, but it's open to the public and it's called Open Space. Um, and it's being developed out of um, my former workplace at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and so you can download it and it allows you to fly through um, so you could fly to different planets um, with planets that have surface data. You can actually fly over the surface of the planet, which is really fun. Um, so if you're if you really want to dig into it, I, I'd recommend um, checking that out. Excellent. Uh, Robin says, I love the creative aspect of your project. I'm fascinated by the subject. Now, you probably get this question all the time, even <laughs> still. I know it's been I know it's been a few years, but Bob would like to know in big capital letters, why is Pluto no longer a planet? <laughs> yeah, so uh, the there's there's it's a it's a definitely an odd one out. So I showed you the the orbits of the planets in the solar system, and you could see that the rest. You know, it's so funny. I still say the rest of the planets because <laughs> that shows you how old I am. But they're all in a plane, right? Um, except Pluto. Pluto's not on a plane, right? It's at an angle. Its orbit is at an angle if you're kind of tracing it out. Um, and there's a lot of other objects that have similar similar orbits um, to that, that have similar masses as Pluto. Um, and uh, and so so that's there's one one reason would be you'd have to kind of include these other objects um, because they're they're just as much a planet as Pluto is. Um, but the real reason is they decided the definition was going to include uh, the fact that Pluto has, so planets have cleared their orbit. So basically they've um, gravitationally captured or kicked out anything little that was kind of in the similar orbit as it for the most part. Um, of course you have, Jupiter has a bunch of asteroids and things like that, but they're so much smaller, um, but Pluto orbits with a lot of other things. Um, and so it has not cleared out its orbit. It has a very inclined orbit. Um, it's smaller, you'd have to include these other things. And, uh, and so the IAU, the International Astronomical Union is the, the official body <laughs> that I guess has been decided to make these definitions. And so they made a definition such that um, that Pluto does not fit. Um, and so, yeah, but uh, it doesn't change at all. It's the same Pluto, right? You just get a discount on the ski vacation. That's it. <laughs> there you go. 
Uh, Fra- I don't know where Frank finds these emojis. We got a rocket <laughs> ship and a satellite. Uh, Frank says, bravo, fascinating virtual tour, a terrific way to teach. Uh, so let's see, Patricia says, can you recommend a very good basic book to explain our solar system? Oh my gosh, this is a bad question to ask me. <laughs> I should be able to do this, but honestly, uh, I'm not as familiar with um, with basic books. That's <laughs> okay, that's system. okay, yeah. But no worries. You're you're used to doctorate textbooks, I'm sure, and things like that. Patricia, uh, email me this question afterwards, and I'll the librarian will do some research. Yeah, and find you know, you a um, uh, actually, uh, Emily Lakdawala at the um, Planetary Society, um, and maybe I can. She she does she does. Um, I don't know if she does like textbooks, but she definitely does children's books. Um, I'm going to spell her name wrong at planetary society book list. That would be a good place to look. Um, another one, uh, Andrew, Andrew Fracknoy um, has like uh, a website. His website has a lot of lists of um, fantastic introductory and teaching astronomy resources. Um, So I would recommend Googling those and checking them out. Uh, Okay, and someone in the chat also recommends uh, Neil Tyson Legrasse, who probably gets recommended for every scientific uh, topic, but I know that he does a pretty good job of uh, breaking things down into layman terms. Um, Do you think we might see a hotel similar to the space station uh, in space sometime soon? Oh man, I financially, it's hard for me to see that happening soon. It depends on what your definition of soon is. Um, but you know, I mean, we are we are technologically capable of it, so it's a matter of like it being uh, financially viable at this point, um, which I think it's rough. <laughs> uh, anonymous attendee asks, if Venus is the most Earth-like, uh, why not try to go there? Mm. Well, it's the most Earth-like in the sense of the gravity, pressure, and temperature. But again, it's it's really corrosive in the environment in the in the upper atmosphere. So we don't yet. So there were some. There was a list of um, missions that NASA was considering, and one of them was to send a plane to the upper atmosphere of Venus. Um, and one of the reasons that NASA rejected it was because they weren't sure that the electronics could survive. So we don't really have, we're not confident that we have the technological capability to keep something afloat in Venus's atmosphere with the conditions that are there. Um, So in that sense, you know, it's better to go to Mars, right? Because we know we can keep electronics alive there. We've done rovers on the surface and things like that. Um, So yeah, in terms of like the the base conditions, um, uh, Venus has a lot of, pros going but again you're also in the atmosphere which creates an extra layer of um, complication you have to keep something in the atmosphere because if it goes down it's going to reach those crazy temperatures and pressures Uh, speaking of that uh francis asks how cold is the moon and is it colder on the far side of the moon (laughs) that's a great question um yeah so it's weird i don't i don't know offhand very cold (laughs) is the answer Um, But it's also weird to talk about temperature because there's no atmosphere. Um, And so temperature works a little differently. But um, what I do know is that you can, um, uh, you do have temperature fluctuations on the moon. And so one thing that they're really interested in is looking at areas that are constantly shaded. So this would be deep in craters and things like that because the temperature there is actually very constant and very cold. And so that might be a place where you could find, for example, um, like you could, you could keep something at a, at a, at a stable temperature. Uh, so you wrote the book before James, the James Webb telescope, I think, went into effect here. True. Uh, so Eva Jane wants to know, um, is, the Jane, is the James Webb telescope giving your quote unquote travel company ideas for future travel in space? Yeah, I mean, a lot of what it's looking at, I mean, it does look at solar system objects and it looks at them in a whole new light, right? Um, so 
JWST is looking in the infrared. Um, and so it's, it's, you're able to kind of see different layers or different um, things that are going on in planets, which is um, a fascinating view. Um, and it's also able to look at like um, regions that are further off and these would be so far off, uh, we can't even really talk about a time when we're going to be able to travel there. But um, but like um, forming solar systems, for example, are um, one of the one of the things that JWS2 is great at kind of revealing for us. Uh, so Susan asks, uh, for, well, Susan says this was a fantastic way to learn about planet gravity, atmosphere, heat, moons, etc. Thank you. And then her question is, I'm curious to know when you became interested on astronomy and how? Uh, for example, what or who were your influences? It's always like a little embarrassing to answer this question for me. So it was uh, in middle school and it was like straight up Star Trek. I watched yep. so much Star Trek when I was in middle school. And at some point I, you know, I, I started going to the library actually. And my library that um, was by my house was called Galaxy Library, just by yeah. chance. <laughs> and, um, and I started kind of reading about it because I wanted to know what things in the show were real. Um, and, you know, the answer is not a whole lot, but <laughs> that's how I def that's definitely how I got interested was through science fiction. Well, as of now, uh, or maybe as of then, not a whole lot, but yeah. uh, who knows? <laughs> Um, let me see here. I think, uh, I think we, oh, well, and then, um, so we had someone join a little late and was wondering if I could recap the author's background and I won't delve too deep into this, but, uh, Gina, once you, uh, you, uh, you know, discovered your, your love for astronomy during, uh, middle school years, uh, watching all those, our uh, Star Trek marathons. Uh, <laughs> so, so then you took it to college, double major, triple major, it sounds like, or double majored and minored or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and uh, yeah, so uh, bring, bring yeah. us forward through, uh, through uh, uh, college and uh, grad school. Here. Yeah, so um, I ended up um, going to college studying, you know, physics. Um, in a lot of places, there's, um, uh, there's kind of like, a, you usually start with physics if you're going yeah. into astronomy or, or a physics heavy astronomy course. Um, and then I went to grad school at Columbia, um, where I got my PhD, um, did a postdoc at the American Museum of Natural History, um, which was really fun because I was working with high school teachers, um, and I really love um, education and outreach. Um, that's a real passion of mine. Um, I ended up working at Columbia for some time with their outreach programs um, and also writing. Um, and I also worked as a data scientist putting ads on television. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> had kind Excellent. of an unusual career. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And you wrote a book. Mm -hmm. um, and so final question is going to go to David, who, at, who writes, who did the illustrations for your oh, book? Oh, yeah. They're thank wonderful. you for asking this. Um, a fantastic artist called Steve Thomas. Um, and he's out of uh, my home state of Minnesota. Steve Thomas. I'm going to write it in the... Um, it's how it sounds, but I'll write it in the, um, in the sure. chat. So you have it. And he, he, um, we actually found him cause he's already doing these fantastic retro space posters. Um, and so we looked at his work and we were like, this is fantastic. We got in touch with him and ha and commissioned the works for, um, for the book. Um, okay. And he's an extremely patient guy because I would come back and I would say, you know, I think like, it looks like there's like uh, gravity here because of this little <laughs> this little crease. And can you remove that? And he was very very patient with my pedantic scientific critiques of his fantastic art. So, gotcha, gotcha. Well, speaking of, so you recently moved moved to Massachusetts. You said, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we need to get you off this call so you can watch opening day of the Red Sox game. Okay. <laughs> so, right. um, uh, folks, uh, let's give uh, Jaina a big virtual round of applause for a, a great presentation. Uh, and folks, look for an email from me either later today or first thing tomorrow with the recording, with the feedback survey, and information about next month's uh, science programs. Uh, Jaina, do you have any last words for the audience before we wrap it up? Just thanks so much for coming and asking such great questions. I love yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> they, they, they were pretty good questions. I, 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 I tend to agree there. So thank you, Jane. It was nice to meet you. Enjoy Massachusetts. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.